Greetings everyone, and welcome to the Planet Ripologues. Today we're in uncharted territory. From the beginning, I've made Volume 1 as accessible as I can. Months before releasing it officially, I uploaded a free draft of every single page to my DeviantArt gallery, some of which have recently been algorithmically falsely flagged as mature content, and not the ones you may think that have a little blood or the arsler, because these days DeviantArt is a nonsensical place by AI for AI. On Amazon, Volume 1's paperbacks are priced like the others due to printing costs, but I made the Kindle version as close to free as they'd allow me, and later put a free PDF on itch.io. The way I see it, 150 pages is plenty of time to tell a good story. Or half a story in Ripple's case. If you can't get someone hooked in that time, it was never going to be their thing. This strategy has worked well for me. One of the most common emails I get is from people who just finished reading Volume 1, asking where they can get the rest. And I even covered those first day logs in these videos. And now we enter new waters with Volume 2, after I've been so tight-lipped for seven years. I had fun with Two's cover, telling more of a combined story than one's front and back did. The front gives you this mysterious first glimpse at Minnow looking quite different than she did before, accompanied by her Zoot as if it's a character in its own right, her friend. I could have shot Minnow's reveal on the back however I liked, but it's framed like you, the reader, walk up to her and she goes, oh hey, didn't see you there. The book opens with a crawl recapping Volume 1. This wouldn't quite become tradition until Ripple's second season, Volume 7 onwards, so it kind of sticks out here. Still no table of contents in this one. We're still in Volume 1 in a way. Volume 9, Progress, the first proper page, might be the happiest Minnows looks so far. With Seth Weaver's return from a visit to the Pris today as a framing device, we learn secondhand how Minnows doing in recent months. She's more fit, learning some self-defense that her new limbs definitely help with, some emergency self-maintenance, she's cooking for herself and puppy, and even puppy's all better. And it really shines a light on how badly the Bellinas people failed Minnow. I gotta look at it. The machine they made. Really? Did you get to see Minnow pilot it? No. I could imagine her inside it, though. I saw places that were coolly designed to interface with the new cuffs and felt ashamed. Don't you get it? She shouldn't have needed to leave the Bellina and join the Navy just to get the care she's getting now. She was suffocating here. She began drowning the same moment Andrea did. It just took longer. And we let that happen. We can blame Christine all we like, but it's our fault Minna wound up where she did. What's this we business? This is entirely on my hands. I wasn't even aware until she suffered kidney failure and I finally started asking around just how cruel people on this ship have been to her. I'd always assumed she was doing fine. I think Andrea wanted me to be like a father to Minnow, but I didn't get that back then. I didn't relate to Minnow, didn't understand people with her condition, didn't want to take the time to make myself understand. I didn't want to end up neglecting Minnow anyway, juggling her with my duties as captain. So I entrusted her to other people, assuming they'd be a better fit. She fell through the cracks until landing in the quite literal bowels of the ship to rot. And this whole mess started with me. How could I ask her to spend another day in this toxic place, with these people? With me. I've thought about going to the purse today to watch the demonstration. I don't think I should. I'd probably just break her focus and ruin the whole thing. She seemed pretty happy to see me. Maybe a thumbs up from you will be good enough. You know, at one point I contemplated making these two exes. Like, they had a thing when Andrea was alive. Seth in his late 30s, Nathan in his early 50s. But Seth got tired of Nathan's character flaws until things fell apart and now they just occasionally meet up to talk. But I never followed through on that idea. Romance just wasn't a big part of Ripple's identity. Keyword, wasn't. Meet the first of a few new characters, and the new most important person in Minnow's life, Danny Ray. And she's also autistic. Her autism is different than Minnow's. Minnow got the Bionicle and Thomas a Tank Engine autism, while Danny got the Sonic the Hedgehog and Invader Zim autism. There's more to it than that, obviously, but for autistic people, I know that'll give you some easy analogs to people in your life. She's just like me for real. I wasn't sure what rank to give Minnow at the time, but I've since decided she's an ensign, commissioned by the Navy to help Anora test her special zoot. Minnow even gets to name it, the Dauphin, which just means dolphin. The plan is to demo it live for a bunch of potential donors and hopefully advance the program further. Once the demo's over, Minnow can do what she wants, go where she wants, though not likely back to the Bellina. While she was happy to see Seth, she is not happy to greet Nathan on her special day. Seems she's realized what Nathan has. To this day, this is one of my favorite early minnow faces. It's simple and sharp. Also one of my favorite minnow hands. This is a bit out of nowhere, but I want to touch on minnow's femininity. 
Minnow's a character I always intend to be a little plain. Medium-length brown hair, murky, grayish eyes, short, a little stumpy, slouches a lot, modest proportions under baggy clothes that hide her figure, but I never meant her to be androgynous. Revealing Minnow to the world in those early days, sharing art like this around, I got a range of mostly good reactions. But this one time in 2017, in a Discord server I left years ago, I was in a group call with like 17 other people, mostly dudes and a few girls. And when I shared some miscellaneous Minnow art, a couple dudes were like, wait, Nick, is this character a chick? I go, yeah. Guys go, that's a dude, dude. Wear her eyelashes. Wear her boobs. I asked, what, do you want her to look like Miss Pac-Man or Minnie Mouse with a pink bow in her hair? Yeah, but dude, in a visual medium like comics, you need those clear visual indicators to communicate a character's gender to the reader. Otherwise, how are they going to know? And I was stumped, but I wish I'd said, uh, they could read it? <laughs> See what the character calls themselves? It was only the guys who reacted this way, though. The girls knew Minnow was a girl immediately without me saying anything, and they stood up for me. But eventually I realized this wasn't just a gender thing, it was an age thing. Every single person in their 50s, 60s, 70s that I showed Minnow thought she was beautiful because they didn't grow up spoiled by characters like Black Cat or Faye Valentine or Lara Croft or 80s toy commercials skewing their perception. It's a generation or two of guys who have very specific ideas about sufficiently feminine character design. And it's gotten worse. We live in strange times now where grifters have made careers out of bashing so-called ugly-fied characters with an average-sized chin or an average amount of peach fuzz like you'd see on a real person's face. And it's as important as ever to push back and not let these types police what does or does not count as feminine because their beauty standards are quite simply absurd. The really funny thing though, while I did design Minnow in those days to be a girl and her look eventually grew more refined, in more recent books, Minnow is non-binary. Though feminine pronouns are still optional, just used like half the time. So when the character was explicitly feminine, my art style was a bit rough. Yet now that the character has changed, my changing art style has made Minnow more beautiful. And just as women aren't obligated to perform femininity, NBs like Minnow are under no obligation to downplay their femininity or masculinity. It's just funny how things work out. So here's another new face, Admiral Johann Sturgeon. He definitely have a theme song playing here. I see you've let her name the machine herself. The Dauphin, is it? Cute. I've seen the specs. I'm not impressed. Just wait until the demonstration, sir. You haven't seen everything it can do. Or Minnow. We need something bigger than this to combat pirate scum. Stronger machines with stronger pilots. Taking advantage of people like her. It's beneath you. The next couple pages are a glorified storyboard. I just love showing how scenes like this would be animated. Step by step, we see Minnow loaded into the Dauphin, how she connects to it, brings it to life, and with an optimistic cover like earlier and a title like Progress, this should go swimmingly. Next time, we'll see how the demonstration goes in Log 10. Setbacks. That's it for today. Check out my books on AmazonEdge.io and my Patreon page to give videos like this early, your name in the credits, behind-the-scenes content, a patron Discord server, signed copies of Planet Ripple, and maybe even your own LEGO Rewind episode. See you next time on the Planet Ripple Logs. Toodles!